Hello members, welcome and good evening, evening one and all. Uh, for those of you who haven't met me before, I'm Anna Spooner from the Tastings and Events team at the Wine Society and joined behind the scenes this evening, we have the lovely Mahesh. So hello Mahesh, who's sat in the office, I think still working hard into the evening, but is handling all things technical behind the scenes. So if you do have um, a problem uh, or a connection issue, you can't hear me, can't see me, uh, then hopefully you should be able to contact Mahesh by hitting the chat button and entering tastings to the person you want to address it to. If you'd like to talk about where you are and what you're drinking, um, as Gordon and Margaret have just done, then please use the chat as well to uh, say that, but please play, press everyone, because if you hit panellists, only Mahesh and I will see it. And then last but not least, we've got the Q&A. We will have time for some questions, but we are going to stick to 45 minutes this evening. Mahesh is going to be thrown out of the office, and unfortunately, I have another appointment. So we are going to be tight on time, but if you have some unanswered questions, please feel free to email the tastings team or tastings at afterwards, and I will answer those by email in the next few days. So without further ado, um, I should apologise for a couple of things, actually. One is that after pouring my suave, I've had a whoops-a-daisy. <laughs> I wanted to show you the label, but it looks quite dangerous, and I think it's probably considered by many to be a weapon. So um, I will keep it just there, uh, but fear not. The stuff in the glass is safe. <laughs> and the other apology is there's a possibility that my dogs may be returned to me at some point during this call. So if there's an excited sort of barking moment, they are staying downstairs, I hope, but just in case. So with, <laughs> with those pieces of information done and my sincerest apologies, let's crack on to the wonderful wines of North East Italy. So just to scare everyone, <laughs> we're not covering all of this, obviously, um, but I just wanted to demonstrate the breadth, I suppose, the vastness, um, not great English, uh, um, of, of Italy and the wine producing regions in Italy. Um, Northeast Italy, it can be quite tricky because I suppose if you were going to put a cross through it, you would include all sorts of other places but actually I'll see if my cursor shows up yeah exactly so actually these places are more commonly known as sort of central Italy um, and the northeast actually just encompasses this small area up here really we're going to talk about three zones and some of you may have already spotted that the wines we've chosen for the evening and I'll come to this when we get to it but the wines I've chosen actually all come from Veneto Veneto sorry I don't know why I can't say that word um, which is one of my favorite parts of Italy, which is lovely. But these other bits are absolutely gorgeous. And we're going to talk about those first um, before we go on to the tasting. Because of that, it means that unlike my other sip sizes, where I try and get into the wines really quickly, we do have a little bit of talking on history and then the um, other two regions before we start tasting. So because Prosecco is designed as an aperitif, or an aperitivo, I should say. Um, please, please, please start with your Prosecco. Don't wait for me. We will do a tasting on it, but hopefully with a full bottle, you'll have saved a bit. <laughs> but please start on it and then we'll get to the tasting, hopefully relatively quickly, but I wanted to warn you. So, um, Northeast Italy, it produces 40% of all Italian white wines. Um, sorry, of all Italian wines, not white wines, 40% of Italian wines, which is a vast amount, um, and 70% of that is white. So 40% of the total of the Italian production, and within that 70%, i.e. the vast majority, is white. Now, the majority of that is actually made up of um, some quite large volume and not necessarily great quality Prosecco and Pinot Grigio. That is not to say that Prosecco and Pinot Grigio cannot be good quality, they can, but the vast majority of production for reasons, um, I'll explain in just a moment, but the vast majority of production is um, certainly of a more mass market scale. Perhaps some people might describe it as dilute, wimpy, watery, I sometimes get, get explained as. But certainly none of those wines are going to be in our tasting today. And they're not wines that you find for sale at the Wine Society either. And um, sometimes the, the wines of, um, of Northeast Italy are also not even 
they don't even say that they're from northeast Italy. They might not be from an Appala Appalachian. So you might just find them sort of dry Italian whites. So when you see those sorts of wines, they're probably, although not exclusively, but probably from this part of the region, uh, part of Italy. Um, I've just mentioned Veneto. And the reason I say that is that, that a lot of the production of Pinot Grigio and Prosecco does come from there. And that has doubled in size over the last 40 years. Um, now, there's some good reasons why um, there has been huge amounts of investment. And I would say that the technology um, boom, we'll talk about it in a second, but it's definitely come from the top down. So um, they, they got incredible winemaking techniques that could make them produce wines in mass scale far quicker than they have down in the south. Um, that's not to say, as I've mentioned, that it's all produced like that, but it's just it's just something to be wary of. So where is all this bulk production coming from? Well, there is a valley called the Po Valley and it's very flat and it's very broad and it's incredibly fertile. And for anyone that knows a little bit about vines, and I love to say it, vines love a bit of stress. Uh, good quality grapes tend to come from vines that are relatively stressed. And that could be stress from um, a few things, but really water stress is, is quite important. So having a, a flat valley with clogged with water where roots can just get lazy and find water too easily uh, it's no good and there's also um, not the best quality soils for grape growing but it's productive you can make large volumes of wine they're just not the best quality so that Po Valley area is 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 um, not so good but we're not going to talk about those areas because don't worry the great stuff from Veneto that we do talk about comes from the hillsides and you could argue the same is true with a lot of northeast Italy um, there's a lot of hillsides a lot of steep slopes we'll talk about in a second so kind of mountain or hillside viticulture is really where we're at with with northeast so a tiny bit of history and I haven't got, you You might be sad, I don't know whether you will, I haven't got sadly a um, historical slide as I do sometimes, but that's mainly because it's, it's a relatively quick history that we can go through here. Um, so the, oh, pardon me, I'm just getting my, my next slides ready. 13th, 3rd century BC is about the time we see wine production in Northeast Italy. So it's had a very, very, very long and historic um tenure I suppose of viticulture if you imagine in the middle ages Venice uh, and that's part of the Veneto region but a lot of you will know where Venice is but uh, Venice was one of the key trading cities in the world so naturally not only was wine production happening in the northeast but it was it was being traded either incoming and outgoing wines so people were incredibly um used to the consumption of wine and there's an amazing fact um, that I love which is in Florence in the 1330s in the city of Florence an average on average one bottle of wine was consumed per person per day and that includes children <laughs> so make of that what you will <laughs> but wine consumption you must remember as well the, the alcohol levels weren't as high and wine was made completely differently in the 1300s but wine as a beverage probably slightly sweet partially fermented perhaps um all sorts of things but wine as a beverage was consumed one bottle per person per day which is only just slightly more than wine society members. So <laughs> there you go. Uh, 16th century, um, what I think is interesting about Northeast Italy that we should address now because it does play into a lot of the regions is that um, Italy, that this section of Italy or lot, certainly parts of it were controlled by Austria, but very, very peacefully. So there was great production of wine at this time, but you will see as we go through lots of Austrian influence. Sadly, that 16th century was followed by the 17th and 18th century with a big economic decline. And unfortunately, what happened there was all these quality wines that were being made, particularly in the north of Italy, were dropped um, in favour of France. And so the French sort of had their boom um, and the Italians were slightly neglected at that point. But post World War II, things get back up, quality picks up, um, there's an economic boom in Italy. And that is when, as I mentioned, northern Italy becomes this initiator for things like um, temperature controlled fermentations. That sounds so tedious, but it means that you can get fully crisp, dry white wines, um, which they couldn't do before. So if temperature controlled fermentations, they were having modern equipment, um, they were being influenced and you can take 
of this what you will, whether it's a good or bad thing, but they were being influenced by international varieties. So we're tasting and at the Wine Society, we like to celebrate the indigenous varieties. But it's worth mentioning that the north of Italy, and I'll, I'll reel off a few names in a bit, but the north of Italy, um, and quite frankly, all through Italy, there is still a, a popularity. And then you may have heard of things like Super Tuscans. Um, but there is certainly a, a nudge towards international varieties. We like to celebrate the originals and uh, the indigenous ones. But at this stage, sort of post World War II, that's when the influx of these varieties comes in. And again, it's all coming from the north further down to the south. So they're some of the first people to to grasp those sorts of things by the hands. But with both hands rather. Um, so let's talk, and I'm hoping I just exited my presentation, which was very silly of me, but there we go. Now my pronunciation is really, really um, not good. I'd say awful actually. <laughs> Mahesh is actually sat next to Sarah Knowles, MWR Italy buyer in the office. So he's very kindly put his headphones on so that she can't hear me make an absolute massacre of these words. <laughs> but the region we're going to quickly talk about before we uh, we're going to talk about the two other regions I mentioned and then we'll go into Veneto. But these are really important regions. Um, and I tend to just be very lazy and call this Friuli. Oh, gosh, I'm doing a terrible job. Friuli but it's actually Friuli Venezia Giulia. Sorry for every Italian that ever has to hear that. Um, but I have to say, this is such a picturesque, beautiful part of Italy. Um, I was saying to Mahesh, I might be going there very shortly. Um, we'll see, but or certainly around the north of Italy. Um, but I have to recommend this part of the world. It is a minuscule little area. It's surrounded, as you can see, by Slovenia, uh, Slovenia, Austria, nearly Croatia you know this bit just down here is really is you'd only have to hop skip and jump over Slovenia to get to Croatia it is pretty hilly mountainous all of those things I was describing um, there are two principal white wine regions and white is probably I would argue that well I think most people would argue the celebrated wine here it's lovely cool climates it gets amazing refreshing acidity in the, in these areas but the two principal white wine making regions are the Friuli Colli Orientali um, and the uh, Collio Goriziano and again I apologize that's the last time I'm going to apologize because it's only going to get worse um, but you can you can see these areas just there we go there's the Colli Collio Goriziano here and then the Orientali just here. Um, what makes these places special? Beautiful slopes. Um, ah, somebody said, think of it as Julia. Julia. Okay. If that sounded better, Jim, then I will thank you for the rest of my life. <laughs> so the 1970s is about the time this area took off, uh, especially for whites. Reds, as I mentioned, are increasing. I will throw the global warming word in there again. This is an area that in the future could really make some top quality reds because they've got some great altitude. Um, Mahesh is also gonna put in the chat a wine that wasn't available uh, when we launched this particular presentation. But I think if you want to try one of the varietal stars of the region, Ribola, um, it's really worth giving it a go. Um, has he popped it in there for me? Yeah. Thank you, Mahesh. So if you do, I'll do use it in the follow up email as well, if you're not looking at the chat tonight. Um, but it's a really classic, beautiful, crisp white, um, slightly mouthfeely white sometimes. And this is a really great example. Just unfortunately, timings didn't quite work up with the event. But if you do want to try one, please do. Um, other varieties that are produced in this area are things like Sauvignon uh, Blanc, international variety, and Pinot Bianco, or Pinot Blanc, um, the Italian word for it. So please do try that wine. It's not very expensive. Um, and it's it, packs a good punch and it really gives you I think an insight into the styles of wine made here fresh uh, vibrant refreshing but full of juice full of fruit um, and yeah that Austrian influence uh, is is evident and the nice thing I think about Austrian winemaking is they they're great at white wines they love stainless steel production and if they use oak they tend to use very old large oak casks so you shouldn't be expecting in any of these regions really very heavily oaked wines that's not really the style but in particular the ones that border Austria even more so 
So another region that borders Austria and uh, a personal favourite of mine. Um, I love the wines from here and there's a particular producer I'll mention in a moment who I follow really quite religiously um, think their wines are smashing so it's a shame again I'm going to send you a link to their wines it's a bit too expensive to include on a sip size but I actively encourage you really to buy this wine um, but the Alto Adige was again part of Austria until the nine until 1999 sorry 1919 and um, Mussolini actually called it uh, South Tyrol and uh, he changed the name after World War One, changed it to Trentino Alte Adage, and lots of winemakers here, in particular, this this very much Austrian border area, speak both um, Austrian and Italian. And the influences again, the big barrels, the food stuffs. There is a huge Germanic influence coming down here. So uh, the varieties as well. I'll uh, read those out in a moment because. I've got a list written down and they it reads basically like Alsace or Austria combined. Um, but you can see almost without even knowing what's here, you can see that there's a sort of valley and a narrowing area. Um, and the Adige Valley is hot summers low rainfall, cold winters, so it's a real game of two halves. Um, spring frosts can be a risk, but then you get these baking hot sunburning summers, so really interesting place to grow grapes, and actually grapes really enjoy that. Um, the valley floor is only about 200 metres, but the really best wine and the top stuff is grown on the slopes at 1,000 metres, so really quite impressive. Um, I said to you, I was going to read you a, uh, a list, pardon me, of the grapes. So uh, the cool climate here would make it, you, you'll, if you like your cool climate white wines, sort of, you might just sort of bubble up with happiness. Uh, Pinot Bianco, Pinot Grigio, Sauvignon Blanc, Riesling, Muller Thurgau, and then for the reds, Pinot Noir. So it really does read like a sort of Austrian Alsatian combo. Um, and there are a couple of other red varieties that are worth mentioning. There's a Chiava, um, which is a very interesting grape. But what I would say is my favourite local grape is La Graine, L-A-G-R-E-I-N. And I will mention the producer that I doesn't have the La Graine at the moment, but I have a bottle of it. I should have brought it up. I have a bottle of it downstairs and I'm saving it. It's actually quite an age worthy wine when made well. And the producer is Hofstadter. So I don't know whether anyone knows their wines. Mahesh has popped it in the chat. At the moment, they have a Pinot, we have a Pinot Nero of theirs for sale. Um, Pinot Nero, I should say. Pinot, I should just put the Italian accent on it, it would make it better. Um, but Pinot Nero is Pinot Noir, so black Pinot. Um, so if you are a fan of Pinot Noir, it's a little pricier than the other one, but uh, they do also produce lots of other beautiful grapes. And again, that kind of Alsatian style. Um, well, I say Al Alsace Austria is where my head goes. It's kind of a combination of the both. And finally, just ready in time for, to do some tasting. Uh, but I will tell you a little more about Veneto first. And um, so this is the region that can produce both ends of the spectrum. Um, the two regions we've just talked about, harder to produce grapes there. I talked about those steep slopes. It's it's practically alpine. Um, here, you don't have that so much. You first of all have a much, much bigger influence from the Adriatic Ocean. And you also have, oh, well, it's a sea actually, isn't it? It's not an ocean. Um, but there are some really flat, fertile soils. That's where that's where the not magic happens. Uh, the flat, fertile soils, soils don't really produce that much exciting wine. And there's actually a lot of debate in Veneto that there's an argument that potentially they're sort of ruining the image of the region, these producers. So um, I think it's worth really making sure that you don't let those wines sully the um or soil the incredible wines that can come out the other end of the spectrum um the appellations we're going to discuss are proper appellations so um i'll go on to a little bit more about that in a minute but we do have three incredibly different wines and it's worth saying the wine styles that come out of this region are vast we have prosecco we have light white wines we have light fruity red wines all the way through to full rich Amarone wines and if anyone's had an Amarone I'll talk about it at the end a bit but 
Um, we don't have one this evening. I will most definitely do something with an Amarone next time we have one in. So don't worry. Uh, they're hard to get hold of at the moment. They're very low supply. Um, but or at least the, the top ones are the good ones. Uh, but these, so we have sweet, uh, sorry, we have sparkling, all the colours right through to dark, rich red wines. And then finally, some really special recciotto, sweet wines. So everything is made here. So let's talk about our first wine, which is the Prosecco. Now I've circled this area on purpose. This is the region, and this is a you know very horrible rough um, circle. Obviously, you can't make wine in the sea, but this gives you an idea. They have expanded the Prosecco region. Bear in mind that these are the original Appalachian or Appalachians, sorry, um, for for this particular region. The circle is where you're now legally allowed to produce Prosecco. So what does that do? What, why is that a problem? How lovely, more Prosecco to go around. Well, I heard it best explained to me um, by somebody a few years ago who said, and they were Italian, but they, you know, it wasn't a sort of fancy tasting or anything. It's, they said, imagine that you go through your life buying Prosecco and you know that what's in, what's in the bottle is labeled legally Prosecco and that's protected. And then the rules change. And suddenly a gentleman that has been growing apples all his life can now grow grapes and he's never grown grapes before, but that the grapes he produces are just as legally permitted and allowed to go into your bottle of Prosecco as anything else. Now, of course, you want people to be able to, to explore and, and try other things, but it was just it's just over freedom. It's too much freedom. The regulations have basically been ripped up. Um, some people think it's money making. Some people, you know, celebrate it, but say, let's let's bring everyone up quality wise. But it is a pretty dangerous, uh, dangerous situation. Now, ours, our lovely Prosecco is uh, actually produced in the Cognigliano, this region here. So this is the top, top Prosecco region and ours is produced there. It's actually in the even more premium regions of Val Dobiedane, the OCG. And I think Sarah doesn't put it on the label for, there are some reasons she doesn't put it on the label. I think potentially it's to allow them a bit of flexibility, but this does really come from a top, top region. So let's talk about it. Oh, she's mentioned it in here. The finest and best come from the hills of Val Dobiedane. I got that one a bit better. Um, oh, she says it's because it commands a premium price um, when you start to put that on the label. And that is very true. And there's a reason. And it's because it has this beautiful top quality. Uh, Sarah and Oz took quite a while truffling this gem out for us. So we are very grateful. Um, it's Let's taste it first. And then I'll tell you a little bit more about it. Because if you haven't already started tasting, then you might be thirsty. Um, it's beautiful nose. The grape variety that goes into this is called Glera. I'll tell you a bit about it in a moment, but um, it kind of makes peachy and floral wines and it's supposed to. Um, because of the way Prosecco is produced, you won't get um, what's called autolytic characters that you get from Champagne or Cremel, which have this sort of bready, yeasty, toasty aroma. Prosecco has um, is fruit. You should really get fruit. I'm getting amazing pear here, fresh pear, just sliced. Um, if anybody's tasting along, please put them in the chat. I love it. Um, yeah, fresh sliced pear. I'm getting peaches, apricots, loads of white sort of jasmine, those beautiful white flowers. Now, um, fizz wise, <laughs> mousse if we want to be fancy, but fizz wise, this is a frizzante style, which means the bubbles are slightly less aggressive. You get different scales of um, Prosecco. What I find with that is there's a tiny bit of residual sugar, which again, most Proseccos have. There's a slightly different grading system to how much sugar is left in the wine compared to things like champagne. There's a tiny bit of residual sugar. There's this beautiful like flowers and pears. And then the fizz is refreshing. So there is a reason wines like this are so popular. I think this is the wine to have in the garden. So have a little taste if you haven't already. Mm. If that's not summer garden wine, I don't know what is. Oh, Paul and Helen have said yes to the fresh pear. Yeah, I love it. It's a really juicy pear, isn't it? You really want to bite into it. On the palate, I get a bit more lemon. I do get a bit of citrus burst. 
I have to also say well done to Sarah as well, because not many Proseccos can have that sort of mineral character. When I say mineral, I mean things like slightly wet stones. Um, and it's lovely. It adds another dimension to this wine. So absolutely cracking Prosecco. Um, and if you lined this up against some of the sort of, um, I don't, I hate to say supermarket Proseccos because there are some good ones, but less favourable Proseccos. The worst are actually usually the ones in the pub. Um, Proseccos from the pub are usually god awful because they can just get away with it. Um, so your sort of cheapest entry level at the pub is, is it's schler um but this is most definitely not schler this is a beautiful beautiful wine refreshing light it's not meant to knock your socks off it's supposed to refresh you so um i think i've just seen indira's already mentioned the adami family yeah this is produced for us by the adami family and they have a beautiful um a beautiful spot called river dei frati and River di Frati is um, this very old uh, monastery and they took it over and um, it's a family business. They do have really quite large scale production, but completely managed by the family. And as I mentioned, it's in that Val Dobiadane area. So it's in the in the more um, premium region of Prosecco. And just before we move on to the next wine, I'd like to tell you a quick story because I don't know whether members know it. They might find it boring, but I'll be quick as possible. And um, this isn't the um, this is Prosecco grape variety is now called Glera, but it has only been called that since 2009. And this gives a little insight into the quick expansion of the region because um, Prosecco used to actually be the name of the grape variety that also went into the regional wine. Now, to give you an idea, uh, let's compare it to Sancerre. Um, Sancerre is the place, Sauvignon Blanc is the grape. Now, people all around the world can make Sauvignon Blanc, but they can't call it Sancerre. Do you see what I mean? So the place is protected. The grape, you can make a New Zealand Sauvignon Blanc, no, no worries. You just can't call it Sancerre. So there's a problem with Prosecco that they had the same grape and the same region. So when it came to the sort of growth of this style of wine, particularly some Australian winemakers cottoned on and they said, I'm going to make um, Prosecco. And there was absolutely no reason why they couldn't produce a sparkling wine from the, this grape variety, now known as Glera, but then known as Prosecco, and call it Prosecco. And so suddenly the the Italians were thinking, oh, my goodness, how do we protect this magical thing that's taking the world by storm? So they legally changed the name of the grape variety to personally what I think is one of the ugliest grape names in the world. <laughs> Considering some of the beautiful names that they could have come up with, they chose Glera. Now, funnily enough, nobody in Australia wants to make sparkling Glera. <laughs> So the legal battles continue and they still say that they want to make Prosecco, but Prosecco have very, very, very intelligently protected their region and then expanded it. Smart. So let's move on. We have, oh, I should show you a picture. I think I have got one. Oh, I don't. I apologize. I thought I had a beautiful picture of the Prosecco Hills, but it's actually in another presentation. If, we ha if you haven't seen it, they are the most incredible sort of mounds i'll check it's not at the end of this one bear with me because this is the as i mentioned the conegliano region here we go there i knew i had it um these beautiful quite highly trained vines getting lots of air and sun exposure and then they it's just these incredible rolling rolling hills and this is the adami family's site so um i thought i'd share it with you this is really you are drinking if you're tasting along you are drinking wines from from here so let's move now to Suave. Um, I find this map slightly confusing because it looks like it's not Suave. It's Suave's here and then Reziotto de Suave is actually a whole different appellation within the Suave appellation that makes sweet wine. So don't be put off. This is, is both types of, of wine coming on here. And the wine I chose was an absolute no-brainer. Um, I enjoyed it so much I threw it on the floor, which I'm actually gutted about because I have to say um, I was really looking forward to finishing the rest of the bottle. Um, but Suave, um, the rules around Suave are that the main grape has to be Garganega. Garganega. Italian is just my Achilles heel. Garganega. It's the where the inclination is that's my issue. Um, it has to be um, Garnegat. 
Mm, not going to try. 70% minimum. And then you can blend in some other grapes. And you can actually blend, blend in Trebbiano de Suave, um, you can, which is this wine. Um, or you can also blend in Chardonnay. But I have to say the people who are sort of steadfast Suave producers don't really do anything with the Chardonnay. Garganaga is actually the better um, quality grape variety anyway for this part of the world so most people uh, you know do do stick to that majority with a bit of Trebbiano blended in and um, this is produced by us for the Pierrepin family now I don't know whether anybody has tasted any other Pierrepin wines and I think Sarah mentions here uh, one of their most one of the most famous single vineyard suaves is called La Roca and oh my goodness, it is unbelievable. And one of the reasons is, is this great variety, Um, It's It can be very vigorous. So it can grow huge amounts and it can grow huge amounts uh, at very high yields with good natural high acidi acidity, but um, bland. So what you have to do is you have to control your Garnaga there. <laughs> And once you control those yields, once you bring it into sort of, um, you know, slow the growth down, make sure uh, you can do all sorts of things. You can change the canopy management, you can change the spacing between the vines. But once you control those yields, make sure they're on a good site, like something like the La Rocca Vineyard or here, the vineyard just next door. Um, you get these incredible things happening. Now, young um, suaves tend to be citrus floral as well and again I think more so um that's like sort of slightly saline um saline note and get oh somebody's drinking the Calvarino tonight that's another one of their beautiful single vineyard Pierre Pan single vineyard blends I think the Pierre Pan white wines might be my favorite wines of the whole Veneto um but the beautiful thing about this grape variety or suave sort of as a as a whole naturally being majority is that it comes when they age, and I'd be interested to see if the 19 is starting to show this, you get this incredible sort of almond flavor and it's a, fl well, aroma and then flavor. And it's a flavor that for me is more prevalent in white wines from Italy than any other part of the world. And it really dings something in my brain when I'm doing a blind tasting. If I get almonds, I go ding. This could be from Italy. And it is the most food friendly um, aroma for me. I absolutely adore it. It's not quite showing on this wine yet. If I had any to save, if I'd caravaned it and not thrown it on the floor, I would genuinely keep this for a year or two and see if it started to develop. But if you have got an older suave, please let me know if you're getting that amazing almond flavor coming through yet. So for me, this is just all the beauty of the young stuff. It's citrus, it's floral. It's not too young. Um, a really young suave doesn't quite have the depth of nose that this does. And I'm definitely getting that saline, something slightly salty. Mm. Mm. gorgeous fresh acidity my mouth is watering I want to have some fish or prawns oh Roger's got the almonds on his oh, I'm actually getting a bit more of it on the palate it's not not there it's it's not prevalent but um certainly older suaves um but he also Rogers is a is a slightly more um expensive uh, yeah somebody else is getting the saline in the almonds great I am getting a bit of it I'm getting more of it on the palate than I did on on the nose the nose for me was very floral and fresh but now I'm getting that sort of slightly salted almonds thing in fact to be honest I'd probably start my meal with the Prosecco and and some salted almonds and then I'd be encouraged to move to the Suave finish off the salted almonds and then go into a fish dish um but really oh, classy it's absolutely um mouth-watering delicious absolutely love it um i think probably one of the most underrated white wines of the world in my opinion um and can age unbelievably um so the other thing about suave is it's a really nice crowd pleaser very hard to be insulted by a wine um i think uh there's a few people drinking some nice options uh yes so do yeah if you do recommend it say um i'm not sure what we're whether we've got any other pierre plans for sale at the moment maybe mahesh might have a quick look and let us know but heaven a lovely combination of fruits flowers salt um it, it's food wine it's absolute food wine for me so i've left a bit of extra time to talk about the lot oh actually i'm gonna sorry silly me i do have a picture ah oh. This is the um, site looking down on the Pierre Pan vineyards. 
how gorgeous um it's actually a little hazy I think I'm tempted to say one of our team took this photo but I could be wrong um it's certainly on our website ad, sort of advocating a visit to the Pierre Pan um winery if anybody has visited them please let me know it's on my hit list and I would absolutely love uh, to, to know oh we do have two more uh wines from Pierre Pan if you're interested uh we have got the Calvarino 2019 for sale so a little bit more of that almond and then I think Mahesh is just popping the next one in um, but let me know if you do go there I would love a trip I will be bugging Sarah for recommendations I just think it looks absolutely magical um so Adrian said we haven't visited that winery but we would recommend a visit to Suave yes ah and we have got the La, Ro La Roca the other single vineyard site 2019 I really can't recommend those two wines enough members uh both the La Roca and the Calvarino are absolutely exceptional and it, should you wish to create your own tasting one of each side by side is about as fun as it gets <laughs> we've done it a few times with members before particularly at italian walkarounds and things and tasting the exhibition which is you know they're sort of more everyday wine followed by those two single vineyard sites it's pretty good right so we are now going to the region of valpolicella and again we've got valpolicella on the map here but also there's a whole other appellation made for recciotto della valpolicella now, um, I will mention there are some other wines made here. Very famous ones. So, <laughs> so it's not just the sweet wine and the dry wine. Um, it, that simplifies it too much. Valpolicella as a region, I think most people would argue, is the jewel of the Veneto. And it certainly produces uh, the broadest range of red wine styles, I think, of any Appalachian, considering that this starting material is pretty much the same. So the starting material is a um, blend and they call it a CRN blend, which is not very attractive, but Corvina is the main grape. Now that is the top grape. You want more Corvina in your blend of any Valpolicella and I'll go through the different gradings of it. Um, but Corvina is king. Get some Corvina in there. It's beautiful, bitter, sour cherries. It's dark. It's moody. It's gorgeous um now corvina has to be between 45 and 90 percent um i think oh sorry i'll tell you what that is it's 45 and 90 percent of the growers growth so the the vines they actually grow um but it does have to make up majority of the blend i believe but corvina is what you want most people do rondinella is then this the r and that has to make up five to thirty percent of your vineyard and it's no longer compulsory to grow Molinara, but that is sometimes the third grape. Now, you are finding more and more people are producing Corvina Rondinella blends, but you can have Corvina Rondinella Molinara, and it's very, very common to do so. Just remember the Molinara is there more as a sort of salt and pepper. It's not going to be making the bulk of your of your wine, a bit like you would expect Grenache in the Southern Rhone um, to, to be the hero of the, the red blends. Um, so we take those grape varieties, let's say we've got all three, um, and the first style that you can produce is Valpolicella. Now this is actually a Valpolicella Classico, which is actually slightly different. I'll talk about the Classico if I have time at the end and what that means. But this is a Valpolicella. This is light, fruity, delicious, um, sort of the ultimate pizza wine, you might argue. Um, very easy to drink. There are very, very few wines in the world that go with um, tomato based dishes and Valpolicella is one of them so top notch um so you've got Valpolicella that's the entry level now then you might have heard of that it's very very big brother called Amarone now Amarone is what they do I was going to have some props and I've not done very well I was going to have corks and then I was going to lie them on a mat but it's going to get too complicated but they effectively take all of the grapes they pick them and they already pick them when they're pretty full of natural sugars and they um, put them on these beautiful straw mats and they dry them out in the sun so they effectively make raisins once they have those beautiful raisins when they were really really raisined uh, they used to make a sweet wine but what they do now is they um they get them to the point where they're not quite recciotto um so when they're not quite ultimate ultimate um must be going into sweet wine grapes 
And then they put them into um, this amazing, I don't want to say it's a dry wine because I think that would be misleading. It is fermented as much as it possibly can to nearly, well, you'd still call it dry, but you often find there's some residual sugar in there. But what you do is you've taken a di, um, a concentrated grape. All of the water has been sucked out by the sunshine um, and by having its little sunbed on its mats. And so you basically press this nectar. And when that nectar gets fermented in, to a dry wine it's this rich indulgent creamy unbelievably alcoholic they're about 16 percent but it is a wine you have one glass of as a treat and um, it's still dry so it's not a pudding wine um i would say i've had it in a um a wine bar in rome with shavings of dark chocolate and that was perfect but you don't want sweet food with it it's still not got sh proper sugar in it it's dry but it is rich and full um you know the sort of thing that matches a very heavy stew so same grape varieties completely different process so we've got valpolicella at the top of our tree lovely and light amarone the big boy and then what happens is once they've finished using the grapes of the amarone so once they've pressed those incredible raisins some clever producers invented something in the middle so they take the really really big um sugary juicy grape skins full of tannins full of everything um they plonk them in in the middle of, let's say, a giant sieve. This isn't exactly how they do it, but I think for visualization it works. Put them in their big sieve and then they pour the Valpolicella wine through it. And that is the repasso. Um, that's not actually the technicalities of it, but basically what they do is it's a little bit um, like a coffee uh, putting your putting your water through coffee grinds. Valpolicella is by no means water, but certainly it's going through that filtering type system or is picking up all those extra bonus bits of amarone and so you get sort of people call it amarone's baby brother but i think it's also valpolicella's older brother so um it's it's basically the perfect marriage in the middle and it can be not always some of them are pretty poor quality because people just know it will sell um but it can be a really, really stonking wine. And because Amarones are so expensive, if you think you're basically pressing raisins, you're not going to make much of it. You're going to have to charge three times the amount for it. Valpolicella can be a really, sorry, Valpolicella Rapasso can be a really good introduction uh, into that style. So this is just regular Valpolicella. Now, Re Valpolicella Rapasso and Amarone and the sweet one, I would not have on my Wednesday night pizza night. This bottle of wine is the only wine I think I'd have on my Wednesday night pizza night. It is perfect for it um it's vibrant refreshing i mentioned i was going to go back to the classico thing in a moment um in fact i'll do it really quickly um the allegrini family are pioneers in the valpolicella region but they think some of the rules are quite archaic and um, now i don't know mine doesn't but there was um but might, might be because it's half bottle it's quite hard to do some of you might have screw tops now because they bottle some of it in screw top it means they can't call it a classico it's a silly old rule that says it must be under cork they're the sort of people that like to rip up the rule book lovely old traditional family but really doing things in a kind of maverick way um and giovanni Alleg um, allegrini was sort of the driving force behind valpolicella as a region or certainly one of them uh, during the 20th century and i think it's his grandson um who who looks after the estate now so on the nose sour black cherry loads of red fruit i mean it's a cherry 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 party for me but there is that touch of herbalness something slightly herbal um not woody, more aromatic and lifted than that. It's almost a floral herby thing. Oh, it's full of fruit again. I mentioned we were going to have some fruity wines. Um, Valpolicella will age. Valpolicella Rapasso will also age a bit more, but Amarone is really the one you want to start aging and, and you start to do some really fun things with that kind of dried fruits, figs, get even drier and even figgier. Um, but these wines are meant to be drunk young, young and delicious and fruity. So let's have a taste. Oh, delicious, fresh, fruity, high, high, high in acid. And I'd actually don't think it's a very acidic grape variety. So I think they've worked really hard to ensure that they get that sort of fruity um, tart 
Uh, there's a beautiful tartness that comes with Corvina and they've really nailed it. And like Sarah says, cherry and red fruits, absolutely. Still soft edges, those tannins aren't too cloying. It is a really juicy style. So yeah, love it. And this is their beautiful place. I don't think that's actually their place of residence, but this is the incredible 16th century um, spot they have near Lake Garda, which they've been making wine here since the 16th century. So this, like I said, this beautiful historic family who love to um, push the envelope, shall we say. Uh, and I think it's been a bit of a pleasure working with them over the years. So keep an eye out for their wines with us as well. Uh, I think I just spotted in the chat. Yes, David said he was puzzled as to why our screw, screw top bottle wasn't labelled Trasco. There you go, David. It's all the grapes are from, I didn't explain what the Trasco region was, so I'll quickly do that before we finish off. But I've talked at length a couple of times, Prosecco, a little bit touched on it in, um, in the um, Suave as well, about expansion in this part of Italy. Expansion uh, and sort of wanting to increase the area that legally can label their bottles of a certain appellation. If you see Suave Classico, oh, I'm scared of my... <laughs> My danger weapon, Suave Classico, really important in the Suave region. Um, it would be Valpolicella Classico um, if they were making a wine that wasn't, uh, that they weren't screw capping. But those Classico regions are really important because they demonstrate that it's from the original site, not the expanded site. So it's not, these are grapes that come from the original heartland of the region where the viticulture is ingrained in, in the soil, in the souls, in all of it, and not from this sort of expanded area, uh, which can be good. I don't want to diss it completely, but if you want to have a bit more of a guarantee for quality, then when you're looking in Northeast Italy, that word Classico becomes really quite important. Right, lovely stuff. It was a pleasure to have you, and I'm so sorry we do have to dash off this evening. As I said, please, please, please send through any questions. I won't be able to answer them tomorrow, but I will try and get to them on Thursday. I love seeing all your questions, they're absolutely fascinating. Um, so please let me know. I've just seen David say, Why does Prosecco Classico not matter? Prosecco is so huge now. Uh, you just want to look for things like Val Dobbiadane um, and those, those regions rather than even Classico. It's too huge. <laughs> but I hope you enjoyed the session. Mahesh, thank you again so much. Uh, you always make my life so unbelievably easy. Members, uh, hope to see you soon. And uh, oh, I don't even know. I think I'll go back to the Prosecco um, for, my next, for, my, for my next meeting this evening. Thank you so much all and have a lovely rest of the week.